For a show that was born in the shadow of Family Guy, American Dad has embraced the American spirit and blossomed into its very own independent entity. You! Stay beautiful. And with 12 seasons in the can, that's a whole lot of identity to cover. And we did our research. So much freaking research. We've got everything from the Night of the Hurricane crossover event to the show's big move to TBS to facts about the show's expansive roster of side characters. So, whether you're a diehard fan or just wondering what all the fuss is about, we've got something for everyone as we count 107 more facts about American Dad. So, let's get started. Yeah, that's what your mom said last night. Number one, American Dad was never intended to be a CIA show. McFarlane said that, like The Sopranos, it's about the characters themselves, not Stan's profession. Number two, the cast and the crew agree that the family being at the core of the show is what makes viewers want to keep watching. Whether the episodes are crazy or grounded, no matter what, the connection to the Smith family will always be at the center of the show. Number three, incidentally, the creators have also said that the heart of the show is what keeps it distinct from Family Guy. Number four, one of the other big differentiators between Family Guy and American Dad? No flashbacks in the latter. And there was that time I took a whiz in public? Or at least a maximum of one per episode. Number five, Seth MacFarlane has said that American Dad plot lines are way more bizarre than Family Guy plot lines, often taking a crazy left turn that his show wouldn't quite take. And we're talking about a show with chicken fights here. So... Yeah, pretty bizarre. Number six, what would creator Mike Barker be doing if he weren't writing comedy? Well, Seth MacFarlane has said that he would literally be in a psych ward. Aren't all comedic geniuses a little bit crazy, though? Number seven, Matt Weitzman cited Monty Python as a source of inspiration for American Dad. Just like the British comedy troupe, the humor is silly and sometimes crazy, but still centers around a core storyline. Number eight, very early on, there was going to be a George Bush episode, but the idea was scrapped so that the show wouldn't date itself. Damn! Number 9. The show has dated itself at least once before, though. It once made a joke about former White House counsel Harriet Myers, and by the time the episode came out, not even the writers remembered who that was. <laughs> Number 10. They also need to look out for the opposite problem, making a premature topical joke. They once had Stan rooting for Virginia Tech during March Madness, which had to be changed to Georgetown after the real-life shootings happened there after the episode's production. Number 11. Even though the show has a floating timeline, the creators are sure to stick to the continuity that they do introduce. That that way, things like character marriages or deaths actually do influence the show, instead of everything just lasting for a single plot line and being reset. Number 12. Scott Grimes, the voice of Steve, feels that even though the show is a floating timeline where no one ages, there's still so much story potential for Steve that it isn't holding the character back. Number 13. The political banter between Haley and Stan didn't stay funny for nearly as long as the creators thought it would. It became clear that it would turn the show into a what topic are they arguing about this week type of storyline. They had to evolve the dynamic into something less overt to make it work. Number 14. Reginald the Koala was another comedic element that didn't last as long as they thought. The creators loved the idea when it was first pitched, but it became hard to escape the talking animal model that was already claimed by Family Guy. Number 15. American Dad is written like a more traditional sitcom, meaning there's not much wiggle room for the actors to improvise. As Rachel McFarland said, the writers write and the actors say the words the writers write. Number 16. The American Dad writers are good at knowing where the line is with their jokes, but once they crossed it with a gag that even Sir Patrick Stewart was not comfortable with. The joke implied that his character was a pedophile, and Stewart, of course, was not game for that. Number 17. Seth MacFarlane has also requested a line change. Steve once had a line about a bulimic person losing weight, commenting, he's doing a reverse Jason Siegel, but MacFarlane knows Siegel and requested the joke be altered for the sake of his friend. Number 18. Seth MacFarlane cited one of his favorite moments of the show being the scene where Stan is disguised as a gynecologist, and, well, you kind of have to see the scene, but it's a great mislead and definitely up MacFarlane's alley. Number 19. The town name. Langley Falls is a mashup of two real Virginia towns, Langley and Great Falls. Langley is the real-life location of the CIA headquarters. Number 20. Langley Falls zip code is 23665. This is the real zip code for Hampton, Virginia. Number 21. Langley Falls is actually sister cities with Haifa in Israel. It's all making sense. Kind of. Number 22. McFarland said that of all the branches of modern conservatism, Stan is the best representative of the Tea Party. Number 23. When asked who Stan would have voted for in the 2012 election, McFarland said Rick Perry, since Mitt Romney seemed too level-headed for Stan. Hmm, I guess we know who Stan would have voted for in 2016, huh? Number 24. Speaking of, President-elect Donald Trump has actually appeared in American Dad before when he demands royalties from Stan for using his signature catchphrase, You're fired. Number 25. Stan loves the Tea TV show 24, but hates Kiefer Sutherland. Huh. 
Usually it's the opposite. Number 26. Ironically, Kiefer's father, Donald Sutherland, rejected an offer to voice himself in the episode The Best Christmas Story Never, as did Jane Fonda and Martin Scorsese. Number 27. Stan appears in the episode of The Simpsons titled The Italian Bob in the police book as guilty of plagiarismo de plagiarismo. This means plagiarism of plagiarism, the joke being that American Dad ripped off Family Guy, which ripped off The Simpsons. Number 28. Stan used to be afraid of seagulls. He got over it when he was stranded on an island in the episode Choosing wives choose Smith. Number 29. Stan has mentioned that he'll never allow a dog in the house, but the Smiths had already owned dogs on two separate occasions, including the pilot. Francine even points it out to Stan. Number 30. The episode, 42-year-old virgin, is all about how Stan has never killed anyone, but he totally has, like in It's Good to Be the Queen when he kills Jackson's double. Number 31. According to Scott Grimes, McFarlane can transition seamlessly between Roger and Stan lines during recordings without missing a beat from either of them. Number 32. McFarlane can also enter a table read cold and nail every single joke. If only every comedian could do that. Number 33. McFarlane knew Wendy Shaw, who voices Francine, from the movie The Burbs, which he loves. But apparently no one else in the Family Guy writer's room does. Number 34. Actually, Stan loves it too. He tells Francine that The Burbs is his favorite movie in the episode Widowmaker. Number 35. An idea was pitched for Steve's girlfriend Debbie to lose weight, causing Steve to lose his interest in her. However, they felt as though this would be a betrayal to her character, so the plot was scrapped. Number 36. Seth MacFarlane knew Scott Grimes from Critters, but they were first introduced by Family Guy producer Kim Furtman. Number 37. In the episode Boring Identity, the doctor who tells Francine about Stan's amnesia looks like Archie Morris from ER. Morris was played by Scott Grimes, who also voices the doctor in the episode. Number 38. Shortly after Scott Grimes came out with his LP, Living on the Run, the show's creators had him start singing on the show. The lesson here? Never release an LP as a voice actor unless you're ready to be exploited for your voice. Number 39. Speaking of which, Rachel McFarlane also put out a record called Haley Sings due to her vocal work on the show. Number 40. Haley's character was loosely based on Rob Reiner's character from All in the Family, the liberal who was always at war with his father-in-law. Sound familiar? You are a meathead. Number 41. Rachel McFarlane voiced Haley during the original American Dad pitch, but she was recast for the show. Then the network decided that they actually preferred the original voice, so they went and they asked her back. Number 42. Seth and Rachel McFarlane, who are brother and sister, already play father and daughter on the show, but sometimes they end up playing love interests. For instance, Stan's body double and Haley. Awkward. Number 43. Roger is made entirely of cartilage. He has no bones at all in his body. I guess he can't break anything at least. Number 44. Roger crashed on Earth in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, the same year and place as the famous UFO sighting. Number 45. Barker is afraid of showing Roger's home planet because once he does, he fears that the audience won't be interested in going back to Earth. Um, Show us the goods, dude. Number 46. Klaus was originally intended to play a much more minor role in the show, but the writers really embraced the character and wanted to keep fleshing him out. Number 47. By day, Sir Patrick Stewart voices Avery Bullock on American Dad. By night, he performs classic plays in the theater. He finds the stark contrast funny, and he's sure his fans would too, if they knew. Number 48. The showrunners were originally worried about giving Patrick Stewart criticism on his voice work because, I mean... Come on, it's Patrick Stewart. They eventually realized, though, that he had no ego and just wanted to do the best performance possible. What a guy. Number 49. Seth MacFarlane came up with the idea that the head of the CIA should be British and that no one should question it. Number 50. Sir Patrick Stewart has joked that nobody will realize Bullock is an Englishman until the series finale. Number 51. Bullock is a cocaine addict and is part of a group of responsible users. We're doing cocaine and shooting guns. Join us! Number 52. Bullock sometimes has an adopted son named Avery Jr., but only sometimes. He is seen without him in Family Land, stating, this is not one of those times. Number 53. Bullock had a wife named Miriam, who appeared only once in One Little Word before she was killed off-screen by Roger's persona, Ricky Spanish. Number 54. Sir Patrick Stewart is thankful to the show for opening him up to the world of comedy. He hadn't considered himself a comedic actor, but being on the show had allowed him to show off his comedic chops. Number 55. The show is a bit more time-consuming for the series regulars than for other voice actors. They do table reads on Wednesdays and record on Fridays, making the script changes throughout. Number 56. Since the show has been running quite a 
a while, it's gotten easier for the creators to book higher profile guest stars, as opposed to earlier seasons when they'd be shot down constantly. Number 57. The creator discovered that Kevin Bacon was a fan of the show when they saw that his Twitter profile picture was Roger dressed up as him. They used that to ask him to be on the show. Number 58. The showrunners in the cast have been trying to get Russell Crowe to make an appearance. They constantly send him scripts that he likes, but he never has the time to appear. Maybe one day. Number 59. Buffy the Vampire Slayer alumni Sarah Michelle Gellar and Allison Hannigan reunited in the episode Virtual Instanity, where Gellar voice stands Avatar and Hannigan voice Steve's love interest. Number 60. In Fart Break Hotel, Hector Elizondo appears as a concierge. This is an homage to his famous role in Pretty Woman. Number 61. Valerie Harper, who is Wendy Shaw's stepmom, did a line on the show for a When Harry Met Sally parody. She's the one who says, I don't want what she's having. Number 62. Greg and Terry's license plates read, Pitcher and Catcher. Uh, ask your parents about that one, kids. Number 63. The American Dad episode Hurricane was actually part of a crossover event with the Cleveland show and Family Guy called The Night of the Hurricane, in which the three shows featured plot lines with the same approaching hurricane. Number 64. The Hurricane concept was actually pitched by Fox Entertainment president Kevin Riley as a throwback to the theme nights that the 1980s sitcoms used to have. Number 65. Seth MacFarlane had the idea for the crossover to occur via natural event rather than the characters entering each other's towns. That way, the writers wouldn't have to write convoluted situations with unfamiliar characters. Number 66. American Dad's episode is chronologically last in the themed event, so they get hit with the worst of the hurricane. In fact, Barker says the episode is basically the Poseidon Adventure. Number 67. The event was actually delayed from its original May 2011 air date due to tornadoes ravaging the South just a few days earlier. <laughs> spooky. Number 68. On TBS, American Dad is allowed two shits and a douchebag per episode. Uh, uh, the words, not the actual things. Number 69. The creators were surprised to find out via the internet that Principal Lewis was actually a fan favorite side character. The fans realized his comedic potential before even the writers did. Number 70. The move to TBS did wonders for Principal Lewis's character, according to his voice actor Kevin Michael Richardson. He thinks that had the show stayed on Fox, he would have been stuck playing a generic principal, but on TBS, there are no limitations to the crazy shenanigans he can get caught up in. Number 71. With the show's move to TBS, a whole new crew of writers were brought in. That's because the old writers all had to go out and get new jobs. Bringing in new writers brought new perspectives and fresh ideas without fundamentally changing the show. Number 72. The first episode to air on TBS, Blonde Ambition, was actually released online first, but not promoted very much. Number 73. Of the move from TBS to Fox, Weitzman said, It's like you had this family you were born into, and they raise you, but they don't really understand you. Finally, you get older and they kick you out of the house, then you find this other person who actually likes you for you and who you are, and wants to spend the rest of their life with you. Welcome home, American Dad. Number 74. Weitzman has joked that while they could have made meta references to the show changing networks, like the Smiths moving houses, the writers wanted the show to feel as similar as possible. Number 75. The first scene of the first 169 episode actually shows a 169 television screen. TV Inception. Number 76. The 200th production episode of the show is also the 200th episode broadcast, which, surprisingly, doesn't always line up so nicely. Number 77. The title and premise of The 200 are parodies of the CW show The 100. Number 78. When Francine is chasing the garbage man, a song from Ferris Bueller's Day Off plays. This song was also used in Stewie Griffin, The Untold Story, when Stewie is running to the swimming pool. Number 79. The episode DeLorean Storian was inspired by the sound editor of Fuzzy Door Productions, Sean Ian Kirkhoff, actually getting a DeLorean in real life. Number 80. Kirkhoff actually plays himself in the episode as the guy with the DeLorean. Number 81. Sean Ian Kirkhoff also cameos as one of Roger's yoga students named Sean Ian. Number 82. The episode Rapture's Delight originally started out as a three-part, nine-act episode. The writers quickly realized that they had to wrangle it in. Number 83. In The Golden Turd Saga, Eddie and Marilyn Thacker are supposed to go to Boca Raton before she poisons him with rat poison. Interestingly, Boca Raton means rat mouth. Number 84. There was supposed to be a new chapter of The Golden Turd Saga called Joint Custody, but it was dropped for time. It would have featured Marilyn Thacker being attacked by an alligator or killed by a liquor store delivery man in Boca Raton. Number 85. The golden turd can be spotted below a parking meter in version 2 of the intro sequence. Number 86. Escape from Pearl Bailey originally had a subplot where Francine buys Roger a star. It ended up being removed when the writers gave more time to the main plot, which is why Roger has no speaking lines in the final episode. Number 87. Francine's friend in It's Good to Be the Queen is named Quacky. This is a play off actor John Cryer's famous pretty in pink character, Ducky. Number 88. One of the animators threw in a nod to his former visual arts teacher, Stephen Kent, a retired professor from the 
Baltimore School for the Arts can be seen in an art gallery thanks to storyboarder Brian Minolfi. Number 89. Spooner Street from Family Guy makes a cameo in Roger's Where's Waldo book. Number 90. The PTC has been an enemy of the show. They were particularly vocal about the Hummy COK Guzzler, an SUV that runs on carbon, oxygen, and potassium in the episode Love AD Style. So continues the war between McFarlane and the PTC. Number 91. Nick Oliveri and Josh Home of the Queens of the Stone Age appear on stage during Francine's flashback. However, Nick Oliveri had left the band about a year earlier, a testament to the show's long production time. Number 92. Juror number three in The People vs. Martin Sugar is the same man who worked for Stan making celebrations in American Dream Factory. Number 93. In You Debt Your Life, a bald old woman can be seen in a tube in Area 51. This is Gertie, a woman from Roger Codger who is passed off as an alien by the Smiths. Number 94. Matt Weitzman has said that the key to running a good show is not comparing it to whatever else is on TV. The show needs to stay true to its own focus and message. Number 95. Stan Spring Break buddy Jessica Raplansky has cameoed in several episodes since her debut, including Killer Vacation, 100 AD, and Son of Stan. Number 96. American Dad loves to hide the name of its directors in the episode. In For Black Eyes Only, the name Jansen is written on part of the quarry equipment as a nod to the episode director, Jansen Yee. Number 97. There's a restaurant called Cloudin's Fine French Cuisine across the street from Francine's Hotel in Fartbreak Hotel. The episode was directed by Rodney Cloudin. Number 98. Stan is originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Number 99. Stan is 42 years old. An immature 42. Number 100. Francine is either 38 or 40, but sometimes 39. You know, cartoons, man. Hey, at least she doesn't say she's 21. Number 101. Francine is not a natural blonde. She's actually a brunette, which explains Steve's hair color. Number 102. Roger's home planet is 400 degrees colder than Earth. Number 103. His planet also has figure skating, Walmart, and colleges just like us. Number 104, Roger can float on water, even when someone's on top of him. Number 105, Roger is also immune to all human ailments. Okay, I guess that's more useful. Number 106, Steve can play the cello and has been taking lessons for five years. Number 107, Black Snarst, A Love Story, was the final episode of American Dad to air on Fox. Alas, all good things must come to an end. Once again, I'm Leo Camacho, and thanks for watching 107 more facts about American Dad. Did we miss any? Which ones are your favorite? Let us know in the comments below. We have new videos dropping every week, so let us know which animated film or TV show you want us to cover next. And if you like getting more from your cartoons, subscribe to Channel Frederator, your cartoon central on the internet.